This episode is brought to you by Denver Film. Hey, movie lovers, the Denver Film Festival is happening November 1st to the 10th, and this is your chance to see major films before anyone else. From red carpet premieres to must-see movies, this festival has it all. But it's not just about the big titles. You'll also discover hidden gems and indie films you won't find anywhere else. So don't wait. Head to denverfilm.org to get your tickets and experience 10 days of incredible cinema. That's denverfilm.org. We'll see you there. This episode is brought to you by the Denver Public Library. Come down Sunday, November 3rd at 10 a.m. for the Denver Central Library Grand Reopening Ribbon Cutting Ceremony. The library will open at 11 a.m. for you to explore redesigned spaces like the new Children's Library and the one-of-a-kind teen space. Enjoy live entertainment, refreshments, giveaways, and more. RSVP is encouraged at denlib.org slash celebrate. That's D-E-N-L-I-B dot org slash celebrate. Today on CityCast Denver, all eight of Colorado's congressional districts are up for grabs this November. Some of those races are super tight, some are super not. So I've got a couple of super insiders, one on the left and one on the right, who also happen to be old friends, to sit down with me and break down everything you need to know about who these candidates are, who's going to win, and why it matters. Strap in, this one's a wild ride. Today is Monday, October 28th. I'm Paul Caroli, and here's what Denver's talking about. All right, welcome to the show, everyone. Election day is a little over a week away. We're talking politics. I got a couple of great guests joining me from opposite sides of the political spectrum. First, he's a longtime friend of the show, co-host of the excellent Get More Smarter podcast, and a Democratic strategist. Ian Silveri, welcome back. Hey, Paul. Thanks for having me. And on my left, but the the the, the right side of the spectrum, she's a first-time guest, formerly Ian's foil on Nine News, a Republican strategist. Kelly Maher. Welcome to the CityCast Denver. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. So I have invited you two today to do something very simple. We are going to count to eight. Oh. That's it. Just one to eight. We're not good at doing simple things. That's true. We make things more complex. All the time. Truth. I I can't wait. I can't (laughs) wait to get into it. So Colorado's got eight congressional districts. Correct. They're all up for grabs in November. Some races are closer than others. Some we'll we'll talk about a little longer. Some we'll talk about a little less, but they're all interesting. Yes. Um, So let's get right into it. District number one. Denver. Diana DeGetz represented this place since 1997. She's running against this Republican challenger, Valdemar Archuleta. I want to know what you all are watching here. Kelly, you want to take this one first? I mean, I think that the thing I'm watching in the first and the thing a lot of people have been watching in the first is like, when is uh, Congresswoman DeGette going to retire? Mm. And what does that look like for the future of the Democrat Party in Colorado? Because she's she's just been in that seat for basically ever Mm -hmm. and i think it's going to be fascinating to see it's kind of one of those bellwethery type of things not necessarily because as somebody who has helped in the past recruit republicans to run for that seat Mm -hmm. it is basically you're walking up to somebody and saying hello would you like to be a sacrificial lamb yes I, i mean that's that's just what it is like right the math is horrible for republicans um, the one thing I will say that I thought was really interesting is Archuleta is uh, a gay Republican, mm-hmm. and he really pushed hard against the Republican Party during some of this conversation um, that early on in the in kind of like the primary, and we had the the Republican Party coming out with some pretty controversial emails that were getting some national attention. Yeah, the and, chair of the party, Dave Williams, he yep. sent out this email that was <laughs> alluding to something the Westboro Baptist Church God had hates said. Flags, God hates flags. Yeah, think, yeah. Is it was not a great not look. Funny. Yeah, yeah. And Valdemar was, rejected his yeah. endorsement. Yeah. So I I actually see him as kind of an interesting character as somebody who would be willing to stand up on that. So so that's what I see on the Republican side, but on the Democrat side, I think it is. When does Diana retire? And when she does so, what does the Democrat Party put forth? Um, and is it going to be somebody who's more DSA-ish, yeah, Democrat socialist? Right. Or is it going to be somebody who is more 
moderate. And I think that that is just, and I, I don't even know if moderate is the right word, but just more along the kind of traditional Democrat line. Yeah, I mean, Deguette is very much an establishment figure. She's been there right. so long. She's got a lot of influence in the Congress. The dean of the delegation. She's yes. the longest serving member of Congress in Colorado, has been there since the 90s, like you said. Yeah. And look, I mean, it's not because she's never had a primary. I mean, she right. often faces primary challengers. She just wipes the absolute floor with them. I mean, we're talking 80-20, right? Well, I mean, like, she also huge. has like basically universal name id yeah right she i mean i mean there is there's an incumbency advantage there combined with the fact that she's just she's diana to get right yeah she's like if you most denver voters yeah like became registered to vote or moved here yeah while she was in congress yeah so it's it's just she's there she and, and she will continue to be there because she's done a good job and hasn't done anything to deserve a well, real primary that she has any chance of losing. I mean, for context, uh, I went, you know, I did the traditional sixth grade uh, trip to D.C. as mm-hmm. as one does. And I went to Congresswoman Diana DeGette's office. Right. In sixth grade. Right. <laughs> and she was my Congresswoman when I was in sixth grade. And She's I been am there a long time. no longer in so, sixth grade. So, like, first CD, Diana yep. DeGette's gonna win. Correct. The question... The only even remotely interesting question is, will she break 80% or will it be below 80%? <laughs> All right. Well, that's the question. There you we, go. Let's get a prediction from you two on that. Will she break 80 and then we can move on to some yes. other yes. stuff? <laughs> She'll break 80? Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's Let, move Just on. for context, in 2022, she got 80.3. So this is actually up for debate. She might just get 79.5 this time. We'll oh, see. okay. Well, boy, oh boy. But I think, boy, she'll, oh boy. I think she will break 80. It'll be fine. Right. All right. Let's move on to District 2. Um, we got to keep moving here. There's, there's eight districts. So this is another one. Probably not going to be close. Joe Nagus has represented this district. Not actually sure how long, but he's another person who's like since 2018. 2018. So also pretty pretty influential in Congress. Seems to be a rising star he in the Democratic the Party. Four Democrat in the entire House of Representatives. And he is running against the Republican Marshall Dawson. Um, this is the first time I've heard those two words next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> no. So so I think I mean again, Nagus probably going to win. My yeah. question for you two is. Is Joe Naguz the front runner in the governor's race in 2026? And what will this election say about that? So too soon to tell for sure. Um, the only person who's even remotely announced a governor's race for 2026 is Mark <sighs> Baisley, who's a Ian state Silver. senator. Yes, Kelly Maher, um, <laughs> who kind of tripped and fell over his own independent expenditure committee a couple weeks ago. But he's also not going to be governor. So that's that's not very interesting to talk about. Joe's going to get reelected. There's a there's a couple of questions with the governor's race that I think, you know, it's it's in my opinion, Paul, it's way too early to talk about that. Let's get through this election before we start talking about the next <laughs> one. Although, to your point, the sort of shadow primary for the governor's race is already starting to materialize a little bit. Right. Joe is a name who has been discussed as someone who would be a really good governor, right? There's yeah. there's a long list of people who have been discussed as potential candidates who'd be a really good governor. I'm not, I don't think it's time to speculate on that yet. I just know Joe's going to get reelected. The last time in 2022, he got 70% of the vote, exactly 70.0% of the vote. So I also think he will be reelected handily yeah. this time. Kelly? Same. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And in terms of the gubernatorial race, I mean, one thing that has been really fascinating is there's a ton of Democrats being talked about. Mm -hmm. And uh, people will come to me and say, who on the who's going to be the nominee on the Republican side? And I have no answer. I uh, hereby officially on CityCast Denver for the first time nominate Kelly Maher. No. (laughs) Are you kidding? (laughs) Why? You'll lose just the same as the rest of them. I mean, sure. Hmm. But you put up a good fight. It'd be fun to watch. I, I actually would. I know it would be. Uh, but uh, go uh, for it. No, a woman needs to be asked to run for office seven times. Consider this your first. Uh, I've we'll been asked back plenty in. of we'll, times. Before. <laughs> we'll every time has been that. a big no. Let's move on to uh, probably the first really close one we're going to talk yeah, about yeah, here. Yeah. Three. District three. This Let's is a really go. interesting race because this is the district that Lauren Boebert currently and soon to be formerly uh, represented um, way out on the west, western slope and in the south. So Pueblo, Grand Junction. This is the biggest in terms of the land mass, our districts. Um, but she's not running again. Uh, the person who chased her out is the former Aspen City Council member Adam Frisch. And he is facing a Republican Jeff Hurd, uh, an attorney from Grand Junction. Junction. Kelly, right. I want to hear from you first on this one. <laughs> oh, uh, look, I, one of the things that I, 
oh man, this is a toughie. This it is, is a, a toughie. This is especially a toughie as a Republican. Like, if I had to guess, I would say it was Heard. I think Heard wins. Um, Frisch raised a metric ton of money, and I would argue, and this is a, you know whatever whatever anybody thinks about Lauren Boebert, she is the best fundraiser in the state for her opponents. Like that is that is the thing that she is exceptionally good at is is raising money because of how much uh, people on the left and some on the right dislike her. Mm -hmm. Um, And for some people, you know, that's like the that that is the sell. And for other people, that is very concerning. But in that district, the money has just been hugely overwhelming. I think in the primary Republicans did they they chose the correct uh, nominee in order to be able to hold that seat? Why do you say? I think if it would have been Ron Hanks, for instance, it, it would have been a, a different flavor of Bobert. And what we were seeing in terms of both fundraising and polling was that the district was largely rejecting that style of politics. Mm-hmm. And therefore, like, I'm trying to be really careful about my language with this because it, because it is mm-hmm. so kind of fraught. But Heard is seen as, I don't want to say a moderate, but he is seen as just somebody who will represent in the vein that it has been represented. Can I give in you the, the word? You're yeah. generic Republican. OK, well, sure. He's a generic Republican. And I mean that. In a somewhat complimentary sense, because like a Ron Hanks or a Lauren Boebert are just abhorrent. I mean, they're going to make headlines for their behavior. Heard, I don't know if he would do the same. I mean, like, you know what we call him, right? What do you call him? Bread sandwich. (laughs) Because that is how interesting he is. I don't, I mean. (sighs) And that's not an insult. Like, again, like, people don't necessarily want their member of Congress to be a super duper exciting human being who, like, makes headlines all the time and gets a lot of attention. They want them to go to D.C., fight for their values and their money and their rights and and their point of view, and then, like, come back and make sure you're, like, visible in the district and, like, take care of your constituents. Sometimes they want that. These same voters chose someone to do the opposite a few years ago, and I feel like a lot of them got burned. Well, that's the point, right? So, like, they've rejected Bobertism. They've rejected sort of, like, extreme ultra MAGA lunacy. The question is, does Heard kind of go too far in the other direction? Is he too boring? Mm. And Frisch has been running for four years. He has almost universal name ID in the district. He has, has a metric ton of money. Has continued to raise money even sure. after Bobert dropped out and not off of her. So this is what's really interesting. Mm-hmm. It's it. He definitely got a launch pad from running against her. Don't you know? get me wrong there. But the fact that he has continued his fundraising apace, right. several orders of magnitude larger than Heard has been able to, is really interesting. Now, there's a couple other things to discuss here. I want to talk about the Arizona mailers. I want to talk about. <laughs> no. I do. Yeah, Ian. I do. What is this? What is I, the Arizona like, mailers? I can already. I'm cringing and I feel it up my back so already. Sorry. You're getting like 2016 flashbacks. I. Yes. Yeah. Tell girl. me this, Ian. What is this? You have to explain so, this. So, so, and this is like I'm going to speculate. There's some speculation here because we okay. don't really know. The I Arizona do. Republican Party has sent flights of mail into two congressional districts in Colorado over the last couple of weeks. Right. In this district, the third, hmm. and in Gabe Evans's district, the eighth. We'll get to the eighth. Right. Yeah. It's Adam Frisch is doing such a good job with this. I think it is so smart because in the second it happened, the reason why the Arizona Republican Party probably is sending mail into Colorado is because the Colorado Republican Party is inept and bankrupt and insane and doing terrible things with every dollar they get. Half of them are getting jammed into Dave Williams's pocket in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. Half of them went to lose a congressional race to Jeff Crank, and we will talk about the fifth congressional oh, district. In can't a little wait bit for time. that one. Me neither, <laughs> um, especially because I have some questions for you. Oh, um, but having said all that, right? Frisch immediately said Arizona wants my opponent to win. They also want to take all of our water for their dumb, dumb developments and their bad, bad ideas of having human beings live in the desert. Don't vote for Jeff Hurd because he's supported by people who want to take our water. So smart. Okay, in the third I, CD. I, I will say from a strategic standpoint, yes, that is the way to message that. And it has nothing to, I, by the way, he knows it. He knows that none of this has anything to do with water. This has to do with the fact that, as Ian said, the Colorado Republican Party, the party itself is such a flippin' 
like you clown, can say shit show on city cast clown car mm -hmm. disaster <laughs> on fire like there's like imagine a clown car on fire and then there's clowns running out and they're all on fire also and they're like running around uh -huh. then setting the entire area on fire that right, and then is like a gas state. station explodes yes, like exactly right like and and so there's <laughs> flaming clowns running around uh -huh. that is the state of the Colorado Republican Party right now uh and therefore uh you just need a you need a vehicle, right? Uh, Ian and I both deal in political vehicles all the time. You have to have a place from which to do the business of politics, whether that's buying ads or sending mail or making phone calls or buying digital or or whatever it is. And if I were sending mail in either the third or the eighth, I would not send it through the Colorado Republican Party. <laughs> that was the last place I would do that. And I say this as somebody who used to be the general consultant of the Colorado Republican Independent Expenditure Committee. So I like I have a not small amount of history understanding that process. And part of it is just you have to send it through vehicles that are run by people you can trust because they can – once they get money into their bank account, as we saw with the Colorado Republican Party, just take it and use it. <laughs> and spend it on whatever they want, including, including like, yeah. losing for Congress. Really weird stuff. But yeah. the reason why you use a party is because they get better rates on postage. So right. there's like a practical reason for this. Like <laughs> yeah. political parties get lower postage rates than individuals or uh, certain kinds of nonprofits okay. Okay. or yep. independent but expenditure. Her, herd Frisch. Herd Frisch. Frisch has got momentum. He's got a big you know, bank account right now because he was running against Boebert. I, still, I still think it's Herd. You think Herd, Kelly, I think, I think Frisch is going to shock us again. Running for four years, keeping the name ID, running great ads. Yeah doing a, a really smart campaign and heard, I think could have won this, but will lose because he just never was able to mount the kind of aggressive race to counter the the amount of money that Frisch has been able to raise and what he's been able to spend it on, getting his name out, getting his message out. The last thing I'll say about this before we move on is that the third district has voters who are strikingly independent and they see themselves that way. True. Trump will win that mm -hmm. district. A lot of them are going to want to maintain their independence by splitting their ticket and voting for Trump for president and Adam for Congress. I think he wins. I, I, uh, I'm I not going to make a prediction on all of these, but I, I think I agree with you about that. I think it's going to be fresh. I mean, he's built a lot of relationships with centrist Republicans in the last four years He got endorsed by the Republican Boebert. mayor of Pueblo last week. That's yeah, really that's a big yeah. interesting. It, it is a big deal. And I, I will say one thing you, you said that is true, Ian. Well, one of the many things you say that is true oh, is uh, like his fundraising I was not expecting it to continue in the way that it did. It definitely could have paid, uh, and, tapered off. And you know, you know who he fundraises like I've heard. Who? Oh. Jenna Griswold. What like, does that mean? It just means just that like the, just relentless. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just like Jenna Griswold, I disagree with on basically everything that I could possibly. Mm -hmm. She's our Colorado so, Secretary of State. Yep, yeah. and she makes calls like she does the calls and it is really hard to find a candidate who just will sit there and call and call and call and call and call mm -hmm. adam is also adam has like the energy level of like he's like an energizer bunny type like we interviewed yeah. him on the show on our show a couple weeks ago mm -hmm. he is operating at 2x like mm -hmm. if you listen to podcasts like twice the speed like adam frisch's brain is working that fast so like i'm not surprised that like that's a reputation and i'm sure and it like it bears out because this isn't like the sort of churn and burn fundraising nonsense that happens in a lot of these like scam packs or like bad candidate races where like the money comes in and then goes immediately into the pocket of the fundraiser. This money is going to ads. It's going to mail. It's going to win the election. And and again, like operationally, plus the independent streak of the district, I think Frisch has the edge. Okay. So we're divided on three. Um, let's keep going. Um, we're going to move into District 4 now. This is the Eastern Plains. Um, so this is from Highlands Ranch, Parker, Castle Rock, Loveland to the north. Um, Ken Buck represented this district yep. until he retired. Lauren Boebert is the Republican candidate uh, who we've discussed a little bit. Um, I think the clear favorite over the Democrat, Tricia Calvarese. Uh, Ian, it's time for my favorite part of any politics episode, a disclosure. Yes, I worked for Tricia for... I think four weeks in the primary because I really like her and I really 
did not like one of her primary opponents and I thought she was a super good person. She asked me for help. I said, hell yeah, let's go. And we like worked on comms together for one month. So there is a one month paycheck from Trisha's campaign to my company that we are disclosing before I start talking about why I think she's great, but why I also think she probably will lose. You think she's going to lose, though? I think it's unfortunate. This is like a gerrymandered Republican district. In fact, it is drawn to be the most Republican district yeah. in the state. Yeah, so I mean, like, that's why Boebert's there. Just like, like that is why she re- she hightailed it out of the third, which she lost by 546 votes two years ago, which I have publicly apologized to Adam Frisch and everybody involved in that campaign for getting that one wrong because I didn't think he had a chance two years ago, and I was dead wrong about that. I also think he's going to win this time because of it. Um but yeah, Bobert ran to not the fifth, which is you know the right. Jeff Crank district in the Springs, which is becoming more competitive, but is probably still going to be won by a Republican. We'll get to that in a second. To the tw- R plus twenty two is the rating of this district. So a Republican versus a Democrat should win this race by twenty two points. I think Trisha's running an amazing race. I think she's a terrific candidate. I think she's taken it to Bobert, and I think she's doing it in an incredibly smart way. As a result, I think she will shave a ton of points off that twenty two point buffer that Bobert has, and Bobert might win by 9 or 10 instead of the 20 or 22 she should win by Mm -hmm. because of Trisha's candidate quality and because, quite frankly, of her lack of candidate quality. But the district is so drawn to be Republican that I I would be shocked if somehow a Democrat won it, even though I would like very much to see Trisha in Congress. So uh, actually, like, I don't have a super dissimilar thought um, than Ian on this, which is just like... so I moderated a debate in the primary and Trisha came. Hmm. It, it was a Republican debate. It was called the like Republican Rumble. And she showed up amongst all this of- This is at the Grizzly Rose, yep, I think. Yep. And I was moderating I was the debate and she came and made her best case and you know said some pretty socialisty things that I was like, oh, okay, I'm deeply uncomfortable with this. How'd that but, go over the Grizzly Rose? <laughs> but you know, well, I, you know- the fact I give her tons of credit for right. the fact that she showed up mm-hmm. and she said, "Hey, here's here's what I think. I grew up in a union household, and here's what I believe about these things. And I think it's important. And I think everybody should have health care. And I think that the government should be the one to pay for that. And like hmm. on the inside, you know, I'm like ah. But she showed up and she unapologetically was who she was, and also was doing fairly well in fundraising." Yeah, um, and and there's you know she's raised several million dollars at this point. Right. She's two point six million in the last reporting period, which is insane. Bobert only raised five hundred and thirty two in that same amount of time. She thinks she's going to coast. I think, like I said, Trisha's like putting the fight to her, which is really important. I guess what I'll say is like, even though I think Trisha will probably lose, I still think yeah. there's like an outside shot she somehow wins because Bobert is that radioactive and that many people. Think about like the I mean, population. You could see a Frisch repeat here. It, the district Frisch's district is like plus 10 Republicans. So you could, yeah, you could make up 10 like, points. Yeah. 22 is like trying to climb a vertical wall, right? It's just, it's really tough. But I think you should keep an eye on Trisha because I don't, I hope she's not done running even if she loses to Bobert. She has demonstrated skill, capacity, passion, work ethic that right. you don't see a lot in politics these days. And I hope to God that she runs for state ledge or school board or something <laughs> because she is a wonderful candidate, and I think she could continue to do great things if she's elected. Hmm. I think Bobert wins. I think if she wins by fewer than ten, it's essentially a loss. Like I, I that's a great way to think that, about it. Like, like I'm not looking necessarily at who's going to win or lose that race. I'm looking at what the spread is, right? And I, and what that tells me is like what her political future looks like, right? And what that brand. Uh, And as I said earlier, for the people who love that, they love that. And for the people who dislike that, they really dislike that. And there's nobody in the middle who's like, I don't like Lauren Boebert. I have no opinion. Right. Like like there's there's nothing in between. Mm -hmm. And that tells me several things. But one of the things I'll also be really paying attention to is what is happening in like suburban Douglas County. So this is what I was going to say. Like the population center of this district is actually suburban Douglas County. Yeah. And like that place has gotten a lot more competitive faster than I thought it would. 
Well, and that's why I th- I really think I made this case. Give in Democratic this... state legislators from Douglas County now. That was not a possibility four years ago. Well, exactly, and and I think I've to- I've told you this, and I said this in a speech last week. Like the the political it, the political fights have moved from classically Jeff Jeffco and Arapaho to Douglas and Colorado Springs. And if and so you have to think about how like impactful that is because if I yeah. said the sentence the political center of gravity in the state has moved from Jeff Co to Denver and Boulder like yeah. we'd bo- I'd be screaming you'd, my head you'd, off. Be, on the, you'd be on the ropes but that's the equivalent yeah. amount of movement that Colorado yes. has had now yes. the battleground counties yeah. are what used to be the Republican strongholds I mean that's a shift that yeah. I thought was going to take 30 years took four <laughs> well, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Let's move on to one of those <laughs> battlegrounds. We're talking about Colorado Springs, right. Doug Lamborn's seat for a long time. Very conservative. Yeah. Um, the Republican nominee here is Jeff Crank. I think Correct. he's favored to win over the Democrat River Gasson. Uh, I have to disclosure. There you go. Thank right. You. Oh, yeah. My favorite part yeah. of the We're show. We're all disclosing. <laughs> yeah. There's so many. I wasn't going to put you on the spot. but I'm... No, I'll disclose. Go ahead. Uh, I, um, when Jeff is a, a very good friend of mine for years and years, and B, when he said he was getting in, Although I did not work for him specifically, uh, created, put up a soft money campaign um, for him and also to point out his primary opponent, Dave Williams, many, many Many, 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 many flaws. You, what was the margin were, were in the a, primary? It was like two to one. Yeah, you guys crushed him. That was cool. Uh, well, um, and but- also it was the only Trump endorsed congressional race where the Trump endorsed uh, candidate lost in the country so far this year. Interesting. Um, so Jeff Crank, I or know, or at least at the at the point of the primary, I haven't watched since then. Jeff Crank, I know, I know him as a as a radio host, right? Yeah, Kelly, you, you sounds like you know him personally. Yeah, he's a bit of a newcomer here. Introduce us. What do you mean a newcomer? He's, Tell us about well, him. What's, he his, what's he like as a, as a politician? He lost, <laughs> he lost those two times. Yeah, oh, those two okay, times. Okay, so he worked he worked for Joel Hefley, who was the congressman prior to Doug Lamborn. And he ran for Congress twice Yeah. Uh, after that. And then he went and worked a, a career at AFP, Americans for Prosperity. And, That's the Koch brothers thing, right? Uh, yes, amongst many others. Sure. Um, but it is it is like big uh, freedom-based kind of um, political and more like environmental change uh Organization. And what's, what's he about, though? Like, if I was he's really, sit down with he's him, what really would he be like, fired up about? Uh, he's really a free market guy. Like, mm. he's really focused on economics, and he's he articulates that so well. He's Old about, school normie Republican. Yeah. Well, yes, and we're we're buddies because we're hunters. So here's here's kind of my this, and this is goes back to the larger question of the existential crisis of the Republican Party, right? At, as it exists in Trump world. And I think I I know I do and I know a lot of other people really uh, struggle with that. I don't know. I, I have not talked to Jeff about that specifically, but I do think because he was really careful when Trump endorsed yeah. um, Dave Williams to just say like, OK, yeah, that makes sense. And then move on mm-hmm. next and didn't give it any more oxygen. But he didn't come out anti-Trump. He just let that kind of sit and then let Dave Williams inability to get a message out or <laughs> raise money to just kind of like let it die like a like a lead balloon. It just kind of fell to the floor. Yeah. And I mean, that's and I was saying this. I think I said this to you at the time, Ian, which is the endorsement is only as valuable as your ability to get the word out about it. Sure. And so I think. And I've said this to Jeff and I've said this to other people about Jeff. I think that the the Republican Party in Colorado has to have a center of gravity from which to build. And I think that that probably needs to be the fifth congressional district. I, I don't disagree with you. And if I'm you, that's exactly my point of view and Jeff, too. But I guess what I'm saying is like. The re- it seems to me mm-hmm. one of the accelerants of Colorado's shift from red to blue, and we both agree that it happened faster than we thought it would, is MAGA, is Trump, and Trumpism, and MAGAism, right? And even though Jeff was smart and careful about that in the primary, and I, I agree with you that he was, and he played that right, by getting on that stage, what he did was, I think, solidify Trump's hold over what should be 
the center of gravity for a reformation for the Republican Party if you guys are going to actually become competitive again. So if Jeff mm-hmm. Crank is going to lead the party into a new future, getting on that specific stage with Donald Trump at that specific moment during that specific argument, I think will put some sand in the gears. This episode is brought to you by New Era Colorado. Young people are one third of the electorate. New Era Colorado is a grassroots organization that organizes and mobilizes young people to participate in the political process, to harness their collective power, to co-create a Colorado that serves all people. Growing up, my parents sat me down with their ballots and went through it with me even before I was old enough to vote. So then when it was time to vote, I used to like have parties and invite people to my house to fill out our ballots together. It's a big election year in Colorado and nationwide, so be sure to vote by November 5th at 7 p.m. And remember, in Colorado, it's never too late to register to vote. You can register to vote or update your registration at a voter service center in your county. Just be in line by 7 p.m. on election day, November 5th. With ballot in hand, you have the power. New Era Colorado is here to help be your guide. Just visit NewEraColorado.org for more information. That's NewEraColorado.org. This episode is brought to you by Denver Health. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and we're talking about something incredibly important, life-saving mammograms. Breast cancer can affect anyone, but the good news is that with early detection, it can be caught and removed early. That's why getting regular mammograms is so crucial. The breast care team at Denver Health is committed to helping catch breast cancer early when treatment is most effective. A mammogram is quick, non-invasive, and can make all the difference. If you're 40 or older or have a family history of breast cancer, don't wait. Early detection saves lives. Take control of your health. Visit denverhealth.org slash mammogram to schedule an appointment. That's denverhealth.org slash mammogram. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. As we roll into the holiday season, tensions and stress can run high. I have invitations for friends' givings and Christmas parties and seasonal get-togethers filling my inbox and group texts, which is a great problem to have. But it can also feel stressful because spending time with friends and family is great, but it can come with this added pressure to be our best selves when maybe we just aren't feeling it. My secret weapon to navigate these times? A good therapist. So why not try BetterHelp? It's entirely online and designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime with no additional charge. Let the gratitude flow with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash CityCast today and get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash CityCast. Sounds like we all agree Jeff Crank's going to win. The real yes, question is yes. how he will, uh, you know, handle himself in Congress. How he will like thread the And who the will the president be? Needle. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah. This next district, um, the anti-immigrant stuff is a real feature in this race, I think. Um, so this district six is uh, the one just east and south of Denver, includes Aurora, Centennial. The Democrat incumbent is Jason Crow. He's represented the district since 2018. His challenger, interesting character, a former ICE field director who has accused the city of Aurora of covering up the alleged Venezuelan gang takeover, um, John Fabricatori? Fabricatori? Is that? That's Fabri- how I, I Fabricatori. It was Fabricatori. Fabricatori? I think you're just emphasizing the brick instead of the fab. Fab. Fabricatori. Fab. Fabricatori. It's Italian. Yeah, he's been really going hard on this, this Venezuelan gang stuff. He's like one of the people. Yeah. Kelly, yeah. what do you think about that, the politics of that in this race? Uh, I mean, look, this is a... Again, like like CD one, right? Like mm-hmm. this is a this is one of those races that's basically baked in. But that's and, crazy because it didn't used to be. Because well, because oh Crow gosh. will win, right? Yeah, we well, think Crow about, will win. Certainly. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go on. Crow's Crow's gonna win, and so and and this goes back to I think this larger question of like what is the Republican Party? What is the platform of the Republican Party? The Republican Party that I. Uh, you know, my kind of small government, leave me alone Republican Party is really changing. <laughs> you don't um, say. 
Yeah, well, seven mm. trillion dollar hey, trade deficit. Hey, all right, all right. DSAs say, hey, I, I we, vocally and morally <laughs> and spiritually oppose the DSA. I, I have no problem. So I want to talk about the Venezuelan gang stuff though, because that, that's yeah. what I think is interesting here. Okay. Like, I was at the Trump rally too. I talked mm-hmm. to a lot of Denverites, a lot of people yeah. from Aurora, and I asked them, like, you've seen Aurora? It's not taken over by a gang. <laughs> no. <laughs> what do you What do you hear in that when Trump talks about that? And they were all like, crime. Late at night, crime. And, you know, we hear this in the suburbs from conservative folks all the time. Do you all think Fabricatore, Fabricatore is going to get a boost from this? <laughs> I mean, so if we're looking at what top line messages voters are concerned about, generally not cr- crime is not at the top in no, Colorado. It's, it's fallen like several dozen which, places. Which, by the way, I mean... We we have a crime problem like that is that is a thing that exists and it and Colorado has lost ground in terms of our ability to deal with uh, it, and it depends on the stats it depends yeah, on which a lot one of like people would say uh, crimes I, going down right well, some people say crimes going down others say now we're number four in the country there it depends sure. it depends on how you read it sure. depends on how you cook the books <laughs> well <laughs> crime has certainly decreased since it's heightened 2020 nobody can disagree I, but, with that. but kelly you were making a point what was but, your point but my point is is that resonates with a certain segment of people there are a certain segment of people who that is the thing that gets them exercised and then uh i that is not going to be the uh majority of the people in the sixth congressional district Mm. Based off of what we're seeing, yeah. Can we just like bottom line this race and then go to the Crow. most important one? It's going to be Crow. Okay. He yeah. won by twenty points last time. Yeah. It's probably going to be the same. Right. All right. Let's keep moving. Let's keep moving. <laughs> yeah. District seven. Uh, it's going to be time for another disclosure. Another disclosure. Here. Yeah. Um, so My this... wife is the Democratic incumbent and nominee, <laughs> Brittany Pedersen. Uh, she won by fifteen points last time around against a. a relatively strong challenger, especially compared with this guy. Um, Eric Odland was like a veteran and mm. all this sort of stuff. And and they threw money at him and he, he raised a decent amount himself. And up until, you know, 7.01 p.m. on election night, I was chewing my nails and drinking a lot. Um, and then the results came in and Brittany had like totally housed this guy. It was not close. We won right. on the first return of ballots. That will happen again this time, but it will happen with somebody who put up a, a much less strong fight. Her opponent, her Republican opponent's name is Sergei Matviuk. Uh, he's an immigrant from Poland, has a pretty interesting personal story, but so far has not been able to raise any significant amount of money. And for what it's worth, that's a pretty good signal about whether or not your race is competitive, if you can raise money or not, because uh, then you can get your message out or not. The district was drawn by the Independent Redistricting Commission to be some what competitive, right? It wasn't mm. supposed to be a 15 point Democrat district. Right. It was so more like plus six, plus seven. Brittany always overperforms. She's spectacular. I'm <laughs> obviously incredibly biased. And she has two other opponents, a Unity Party candidate, former Democrat <laughs> named Ron Tupa, and a libertarian. Um, she will win with probably a majority, but even if it's just a plurality, it will be comfortable. Kelly, here's what I want to ask you about yes. this. Uh, I, I appreciate that, Ian, but Kelly, I really want your Understood. take on this one yeah. more. Um, so Brittany was a pretty outspoken critic of for, uh, President Biden. She called on him to step aside before a lot of other people in Congress did, as a, you know, in comparison to, say, a Diana DeGette, who we talked about earlier, who you know, stuck with him till the end. Right. How do you feel about that? Like, where, where does that put her in, in the landscape here in Colorado? You have to disclose that you're a Brittany Pedersen T-shirt owner. I Yes, yes. We did we did go to lunch <laughs> and Ian brought me a Brittany Pedersen T-shirt. And uh, it was great because I actually wore it a couple times. <laughs> and uh, people always stop me. Also, also, just I have to say from a personal standpoint, I am also a Brittany Pedersen fan, right? Like, she's yeah. she is somebody that I would hang out with. Okay. Uh, even... Even though I think our politics are probably pretty far apart, um, I, I, I mean, this this is actually much of the reason that I like Ian and I like Brittany. Right? Is is I think that it's important to be able to stand up to your own people. I think that it is important to stand on a stage and say, "Hey, the emperor has no clothes." Right? Hey, the emperor is a uh, maybe not the guy who should be running for president again if he's barely functioning as president right now. Like that, uh, I mean, obviously mm-hmm. that that was my interpretation, not hers, nor she was much more politic about it. But but I I do think that that takes bravery and I think that's really important. And uh, that is the basis of much of our friendship, right? Uh, like Like we all see things differently 
but I I think I I admire the ability to stand up and say, hey, this is uh this is not okay. Now, I started my career working in the seventh congressional district, the last iteration of the seventh congressional district, which was drawn, as Ian said, uh, it was it was more competitive at the time. Um, but it was a third Democrat, a third Republican, and a third unaffiliated. At that to- at that time, it was basically like North Jeffco, uh, Arapaho, yeah, Adams, too. Adams, yeah. yeah, and and that was in two thousand two won by Bob Beaupre by 121 votes. So that's like even closer than the Frisch Bobert race. Yeah. Like so, both Beaupre and his then opponent, uh, Mike Feely, went to DC for yep. orientation because they did not know who they was the actual congressman. They went together because yeah. they didn't know really? who won. Yeah, so yeah. it was less than a third of a vote per precinct. But now it's leaning Democrat. D. It's leaning D. It's going to get more D. Uh, it, Jeff Coe and Broomfield are the anchors. They yeah. continue to become more liberal. And even the mountain counties like Lake Park, Chafee, wow. um, Teller, and um, Custer, the other, um, uh, and Fremont, the other, some of those are pretty Republican. Brittany ran up the score in some of those and is constantly touring them. Like she's always in the rural parts of the district. I get to go with her sometimes, sometimes I don't. Um, she takes Davis. He has a great time. Everybody loves seeing the kiddo. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, this was drawn to be somewhat competitive. It is technically on paper more competitive than the third. Yeah. But because of her big win last time, the opponent being unable to mount a real challenge, the political environment, all the trends we talked about, knock on wood, I feel good about it. I mean, but the, I, and look, this, this goes back to the entire question of like, what does the Republican Party in Colorado even look like? What is our bench? Who is our bench? I, yeah. And these are- right, where, this where guy are just the candidates this that could have challenged This random just raised her. his hand at caucus that's, and like became and, and, an antiques repairman is, is what I learned about him. Is, oh my is gosh, that's, yeah. first off, that's amazing. Which sounds cool, yeah. Antiques, I, mean, which I thought he was a silversmith. Re- like, Oh, well, that's also dust off the opera, Anyway, but... we, we think Pedersen's going to win. Yeah. We should yes. move on. We, yes, we think Pedersen's going to win. Oh, okay, to the big one. Sorry, the big, yes. We have to have some time here for the big one. All right, let's get into District 8. Um, very, it, intentionally competitive, and right. it has proven to be this cycle especially. Right. Right. This is the newest district. It spans from North Denver suburbs all the way up to Greeley, a whole bunch of rural areas in the middle. Right. Uh, the incumbent is the Democrat, Yadira Caraveo, right. um, and the Republican is Gabe Evans. Uh, pretty strong Republican candidate, I think. He got endorsements from sort of both sides of of the Republican, um, whatever you call it, both, <laughs> both of sides of the right. Yeah. yeah, both sides of the right. <laughs> um, but he's a former police officer. He's a, he's a former uh, soldier, uh, state representative. Um, my first question: Have you all seen any TV ads for this one? No, I've been. I, I, I somehow I, missed them. I have because I live in the eighth. Yeah, I see only TV. Yeah, ads it's on, for these but it's people. on broadcast. Literally I mean, if constantly. you watch any sports game, if you watch Denver broadcast, it, uh, Frisch is up on Denver broadcast too. So he's getting his that's so weird his uh, his Denver market buys in. But yeah, no this this is dominating the airwaves, and and because it is the only truly drawn to be competitive congressional district right. in the state, and it was a coin flip last time. Yadira won by what sixteen hundred votes against Barb Kirkmeyer <sighs> two years ago. Yeah, I'm like I'm. Speaking of cringing, I can feel this one in my back. So she won by sixteen hundred votes, but the Libertarian took. I mean, so it was like eight hundred. It wasn't the marginal difference, was it? Yeah, no, it was more than the marginal difference. Yeah, but yeah, that, look it up. That's I. You I, I, I trust you. I believe you. But yeah. like the the idea that every single Libertarian no, vote nope. automatically would nope. have gone to Barb Kirkman. No, look we're at going to find out this time because there is no Libertarian. I know, we? but look at the spread. I believe you. I know, but you have your computer open. Uh, anyway, yes. So Kelly. The, who's gonna win? Oh man, that it's it's. Oh, a we're toughie. just predicting. It, yeah, it, who's gonna win and why? Oh, this is the toughie. I so the eighth is tough. Uh, in that primary, a friend of mine, Scott James, was also in the primary, and I had talked. I I I told him like, look, this is a really heavy lift. It's gonna be really tough. Um, one of the things that I struggle with on these type of races is that it just becomes kind of a proxy fight between outside organizations. And it has very little to do with either Gabe or Yadira. It just has Mm. to do with like the D triple C and the NRCC and who's coming in and what organizations are dropping, how much mail and how many ads. And, uh, and that is one of the things I really struggle with, with campaign finance reform altogether is that the voices are really taken away from the candidates themselves. And it becomes just a proxy war. Um, I uh, I would give a slight edge to Yadira just because of uh, Adams County where I live. But 
it's certainly possible that Gabe could win. Additionally, I think the fact that uh, Caraveo's campaign is largely running like a Republican campaign, like every male piece I get is like her with an old farmer or Mm -hmm. her standing next to cops or her. And she's talking like a Republican. Especially on immigration. She's had this very noticeable shift to the center, maybe even to the right. uh, Yeah, it's fascinating because she's running it like a Republican. I think she's running it like a moderate Democrat in a swing district. Wow. So you you say potato, I say potato. But I want to dig the into whole your thing campaign finance. <laughs> I want to dig into your campaign finance point for one second because yes. Gabe has allowed the independent expenditure committees to speak for him, and Yadira has not. Let's listen to some of these fundraising numbers. Right in the quarter after the primary, Gabe raised three hundred and seventy four thousand dollars. Yadira raised one point two million. In the most recent. Reporting period, October 15th, Gabe raised 985000 to Yadira's $2.2 million. So we talked about hard work. We talked about call time. Something's yeah. not clicking in the campaign. Well, Gabe, is I... un... Gabe has not been able to raise the amount of money necessary to mount a competitive race in a district like this, whereas Yadira has. So I think that's a huge raiser. Two reasons. One, like we talked about with the mail, candidate campaigns get cheaper rates on broadcast TV than their independent expenditure committee. So every dollar that Speaker Mike Johnson, who really wants Gabe to be in Congress, spends costs more per minute of TV ad or half a minute of TV (laughs) ad than the money that Yadira spends. So she has been able to mount a much more effective campaign with her own message. So to Kelly's point about letting these outside groups speak for you, yep, Mike Johnson super PAC is trashing Yadira Caraveo. That makes perfect sense because it's a district he needs to win if he wants to remain speaker and because Gabe Evans agrees with him on issues that he cares about. Abortion being the number, I told you we are going to talk about it, <sighs> being the number one issue that is going to be determinative in this election, Gabe Evans is out of step with the district on and Yadira is very much in step with the district on. He believe he voted kelly you want to respond to the abortion thing uh, i, I no, want to hear it i do I not want to hear it. No, no i don't want to respond why to the don't abortion you want to thing, respond to it i know i want to I, well first i want to respond to the money thing because i think i think that that was the first point and i think that's the most important point which is i there is not a single republican who is raising at the level like like you, you made be, I, like i i think that the entire republican structure especially in colorado has just been absolutely destroyed i mean trump right? like, raises money yeah, okay and he's running for president elsewhere but i'm i'm talking about like this this goes back to this larger issue that republicans in colorado are not even even lauren bobert who has a national fundraising platform like you used that as an example sure. like the, so so i don't necessarily see so what's see, going on this but, is a good point like why aren't grassroots republicans giving to gabe like grassroots democrats are giving to yadira that is a that's a a great question and i think this goes back to the existential question of like what is the republican party and who the donors are who the farm team is who's showing up and the general gutting of the party. But I don't necessarily see the delta between Yadira and Gabe's uh, fundraising as, because if you look at Gabe's fundraising in the context of all Republicans, he's doing fine slash well in Colorado in in terms of congressional Republicans. I, I mean, he's underperforming like every other competitive battleground Republican across the country. But that's across the country. Colorado is like uniquely... Bad, and that is a thing that we have been talking about now for years. Sure, and I think so, like as a result of that, like yeah. all these things compound, right? Like but the Arizona mean... thing, the lack of the ability to raise money, yes, being out of step on abortion, yep. being too uh... pro Trump, being like not super likable. Like his ads are weird. Like putting that guy in an ad with an iPad, like flipping through it, saying like Yadira Caraveo is mischaracterizing my position on abortion. I've always I... been for exceptions. Is like I would run that ad as a Democrat, like, you, like Gabe Evans's campaign is running ads for him that I would be running against him, being like Gabe Evans thinks there should be restrictions on abortion. Most people in the eighth congressional district do not want the government involved in this at all whatsoever, and he's really weird on LGBTQ stuff, and you know this too. He skipped I... the vote on putting Amendment J on the ballot, which oh, is the freedom to marry I did thing. Not, in fact, skipped know that. the vote, and then his okay. campaign manager lied about it. To Seth Clayman of the Denver Post, I think, or no, was it, um, maybe it was Jesse Paul, the Colorado Sun. Evans's campaign manager went ahead and said, yeah, you know, sorry, Gabe missed that vote because he was too busy negotiating deals on oil and gas. 
Wait, what? As a freshman lawmaker in a super minority, that is like a super obvious lie. Like there is no universe in which that is possibly true. He was making up an excuse for why Evans missed the vote. Evans went to Patrick Henry College, which in their charter has written down traditional marriage as a value. So no LGBTQ rights, no gay marriage, nothing like that. Number two, he skipped the vote. Number three, before he ran for office, the only thing he ever wrote in terms of an op-ed or an LT or anything like that was this like really weird screed in the local paper about how- He renounced this. He, re- I know what you're talking about. He renounced this screed that you're talking about. I've on. never heard him renounce it. So I want to go ahead and just lay the marker down because he said that gay marriage is akin to bestiality. If being gay is so great, yep, you don't know this. No, I mean, like I, I, I but I, rem- I asked him at one point about some of his because I. Oh, also disclosure, I uh, moderated a debate with him too, but uh, he was asked that question and he he said that he had done things in the past that he disagreed with moving forward. I I have it here. Evans in an interview with the Colorado Sun said his views have changed over the past 20 years and that he neither wants to ban gay marriage nor invalidate existing same-sex marriages. He said he plans to vote yes on a November ballot measure that would strip or prohibition on same-sex marriage. Why didn't he bother to stick around in the state capitol when he was there that day voting on other stuff to put it on the ballot before the primary where he knew he was going to get asked about it is an important question. And number two, I want to move on to the next thing that's objectionable about this guy. During the debate that Kyle Clark hosted, when Kyle Clark asked him, is it ever appropriate for you or a teacher to hit your kids? What was his yeah, answer? This was he he's gotten some heat for this. His uh, answer wasn't said, the one word answer sometimes never. Or, it wasn't just that, Paul. It was that he had the statutory citation memorized. Well, and you know, in CRS eleven nineteen point two point six four, it actually says there's I'm really sorry. That feels to me like the kind of answer you give when you like know the age of consent in every country in the world. Like, why do you why do you know the exact statutory citation for corporal punishment or when is it okay to restrain or hit a kid? The answer to the question, in case Gabe needs it, is it ever okay to hit your kid or have a teacher hit your kid is? No. Yes. Some people people have different opinions on this stuff. This is probably unpopular in the district, but that's what we're talking about is the politics. So we got gay marriage, we got abortion, we got immigration. These are the issues that are important in this race. Kelly, are, are Gabe's positions that Ian's talking about, are they going to lose it for him? I mean, I I think one of the one of the issues that all of these races have is that people are generally disgusted with politics in general. And normal people are largely checking out. And so although a lot of these are coming up, the question is how much of this is actually going to permeate down, right, into Mm. the people who are just like, fine, whatever, and take their ballots. Your point is well taken. The one thing I'll say is that Colorado generally has like the third, fourth, fifth, sometimes second voter turnout rate in the entire country, Mm -hmm. due in large part to our awesome mail voting system. And the 8th Congressional District is going to have super high turnout. Yep. Because, and and to your point, Paul, the ads are wall to wall. You cannot turn on a TV or look at a screen in the 8th Congressional District or in most of the Denver metro area right. without hearing about Yadira or Gabe. And I think that while the district is even, while the candidates are somewhat evenly matched in terms of the overall amount of spending that's happened on their behalf or against them, I also give the edge to Dr. Caraveo because incumbency matters. She's run a better campaign and she doesn't have this sort of like weird fatal flaw issue like Evans does on abortion. This campaign is, is believe it or not, like most campaigns for Congress across the country, Republicans would love the battleground to be about the economy and immigration. Yeah. It is not. It is about abortion. Because half of the population does not want the government to tell them what to do with their bodies. And I think we're going to see surprising results on the presidential level because of this. I think we're going to see surprising results in Congress as a result of this. And a U.S. Senate that Republicans should almost certainly win a majority of because of the map could very well go to Democrats or could be a lot closer than it should be just because of this issue. And it's not just abortion. It's about bodily autonomy. It's about a libertarian value that Kelly holds in so many ways that the government should not be telling you what to do with your body and politicians and the government should not be involving themselves in your private medical decisions. Uh, okay. Yes, to the extent that like two years ago, we're talking about this red wave, the red wave, the red wave, and then it didn't materialize largely because of abortion, yep. right? Yep. And so I fully recognize that like personally, my personal views on abortion aren't necessarily in line with where the rest of the 8th Congressional District is. Um, 
And one of the things that I get very concerned about is Republicans' inability to talk about it in an empathetic, thoughtful way that doesn't turn people off. Right. So like we can have disagreements and Ian and I often do about like at what point is is this about bodily autonomy and at what point are we talking about somebody else's body? And as somebody who's had two people come out of me like a Russian nesting doll, (laughs) I did in fact. (laughs) And we've been debating this for like 10 years between the two of us. Like we have this argument all the time and it's really fun to talk to her about it. It's so much fun to talk about it because because this is this becomes this like real philosophical question of like what when is a person not a person and when is a person a person and what is this magical moment and who gets to say who is a person but and can who we like is zoom not it a- back down to this race for one second yeah like here's the crux of the issue if mike johns there is also a possible world a very possible world i would argue in which republicans sweep Trump wins u.s senate and the house all go to republicans that is a universe we could easily live in in a week or two yeah in that universe, Mike Johnson, who is an avowed personhood person, right. very anti-abortion, thinks it should be illegal, thinks it should be criminally punishable on both the doctor and the patient, right, will put an abortion ban in front of the U.S. House of Representatives. If he does and Gabe Evans is in office, Gabe Evans will vote for it. That is not in doubt. I, so uh, There is not a universe in which he votes no on that. I don't... I, I, it, I, it depends on how it's written, I right? Disagree. I disagree. I... I know. And Even if it is the most benign. The Colorado Sun says that Evans has consistently said he would not support a federal abortion ban. I will bet you dollars to donuts, the entire college fund, I, that if Mike Johnson puts a bill in front of him that bans abortion in any way, shape, or form, he will vote I, for it. And he, there is no look, We're way. arguing about the policy here. We're yeah, arguing about the policy here. I, I, I want to get us back to a prediction, and then we got to put a button on this and say goodbye. Okay, I, I, give, a or slight, I give a slight edge to Caraveo. I've, I've said this to friends in group chat, so I'm already on the record. In small <laughs> ways, I will put it for the entire gigantic listenership of CityCast Denver in the metro area and beyond that Yadira will win, and it will be by a bigger margin than it was two years ago. You think? Yeah. Really? Even without okay. a libertarian. Okay. Even without a libertarian. Okay, Watch well, we'll hold you to that. Thank you two so much for coming on. This was a blast. Oh, uh, thanks, we, we made it all the way to eight. We counted one to eight. Congratulations yeah, yeah. to you two. This, this is a beast. Um, listeners, let us know what you think. I mean, you got a hot take on any of these races? You got a prediction you want to put on, on paper? Because we'll hold you to it. Um, call in, leave us a voicemail, send us a text with your name and neighborhood, 720-500-5418. Ian, Kelly, so much fun. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having thanks us. Thanks for having us, Paul. That's all for today here on CityCast Denver. If you enjoyed the show, why not take a minute to tell U.S. Speaker of the House Mike Johnson about us, not Denver Mayor Mike Johnston. Different people, I promise. You can also rate the show wherever you eat your podcasts and subscribe to our morning newsletter and learn more about us at denver.citycast.fm. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. See you then. If you enjoyed the show, why not take a minute to tell... A uh, voter. Tell a voter. Who should we tell? <laughs>